CME Info's continuing education and board certification programs bring the conference to you. The following is a video sample from the Division of Rheumatology, Department of Medicine, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and the Department of Continuing Education, Harvard Medical School. This excerpt is from the Brigham Rheumatology Board Review Course. The lecture is presented by Course Director Dr. Jonathan Coblin and is titled Rheumatoid Arthritis, Brief Review of Differential Diagnosis and Initial Treatment. When someone my age talks about the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, I recall my fellowship when the best drug introduced in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis was naproxen. That gives you some aspect of how far we've come and how far we're going to come. As you can see, there are now five anti-TNF agents. There are many new biologic therapies, with tocilizumab being the last introduced in 2010. And as you know, there'll be newer and newer agents coming through in terms of small molecules, such as JAK inhibitors and sick kinase inhibitors, which will emulate the biologic therapies. Dr. Weinblatt will be discussing that in another aspect of our, of our course in rheumatoid arthritis treatment. Rheumatoid arthritis, as you know, is a systemic chronic inflammatory disease mainly affecting synovial joints with an incredibly variable expression. Risk is increased by both genetic and environmental factors. And although we've heard a lot about genetics, which Dr. Plenge will review in greater detail, the amount of genetic information that we have that confers risk on rheumatoid arthritis is still only about 15%. The strongest genetic association is, shared, is the shared epitope in close association with class 2 MHC gene, HLA-DR4. Cigarette smoking is clearly an environmental trigger, and I'm sure we'll see more and more environmental and genetic triggers and, and associations in the future. It's a very common disease. Its prevalence is anywhere from 0.5 to 1% a worldwide distribution with female to male ratio of about three to one. It's also a disease of younger people, as our non-rheumatology colleagues seem surprised at that. The peak age of onset is between 25 and 50 years, and it can affect any joint, but rarely, if ever, affects the, the lumbar spine. How does it present? It presents more often as a polyarticular disease. More often, obviously, in the small joints of the hands and feet, but about 20-25%, it can present as a monoarticular mono fashion. And when it does, it usually presents in the knee. But we've all seen RA, which is a monoarthritis in a shoulder, a wrist, a hip, an ankle, or an elbow. So monoarthritis is a different, dif different differential diagnosis, but still rheumatoid arthritis can be the underlying illness. There's also palindromic rheumatism. And uh, I'm not sure how everyone considers palindromic rheumatism. I consider that as a form frust or a variant of early rheumatoid arthritis. A number of patients do present over time with what looks like polyarthritis, which is fairly intense in knees, hands, feet, which resolves in this period of days to weeks with periods of quiescence for sometimes months to years. But many of those patients over time evolve into a rheumatoid arthritis-like pattern. I consider palindromic rheumatism a form of early rheumatoid arthritis. The characteristic distribution of joint involvement is well known to us all. It's a symmetric polyarthritis with 80% or more involving the MCPs and PIPs and common involvement of the MTPs. I think the MTPs are something that people don't often think about. And when one looks at x-rays of hands and feet in rheumatoid arthritis, more often than not, one is going to see erosions in feet than in hands, but patients complain less about feet and hands. So in early evaluation, it's not unreasonable to x-ray feet and hands, even though the patient is not very symptomatic upon their feet. As mentioned, al almost every joint can be affected. I'll spend some time on the cervical spine uh, because of the obvious implications of cervical spine disease and rheumatoid arthritis, and eventually there's erosive damage. The point of early treatment would be to prevent the erosive damage. The laboratory manifestations of rheumatoid arth arthritis are shown on this uh, one slide. Anemia of chronic disease is very common, and more often than not, patients will have a leukocytosis and a thrombocytosis. Leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, when one is seen when one is evaluating a patient with, with polyarthritis, should be a red flag that this may not be rheumatoid arthritis. Someone with known rheumatoid arthritis with leukopenia must be considered for other differential possibilities. These include, obviously, adverse events of drug therapy, Felty syndrome, and large granular lymphocyte syndrome or leukemia. This is seen more and more in, in our patients. 
There's obviously an elevation of the SID rate, CRP. 80% to 90% will have a positive rheumatoid factor. 75 to 90% will have a positive anti-citrullinated peptide antibody, which is the current designation of CCP. And anywhere from 30 to 50% will have a positive ANA, which obviously is of no significance in our patients with rheumatoid arthritis. The hallmark and in initial differential diagnosis would be to document an inflammatory synovial fluid, and of course, there's hypergamma globulinemia. The pathology of RA is in the joint is similar to the pathology of RA in tendon sheaths, bursa, and the lining of the, uh, the lung and the heart. It's for that reason we'll see bursitis, tendonitis, pleuritis, and pericarditis. Rheumatoid nodules occur on extensive surfaces, as you know, and weight-bearing surfaces, uh, and often there can be rheumatoid vasculitis. With more and more aggressive therapy and with more and more early intervention, we are often seeing less vasculitis and less nodules. Top quality board certification reviews and continuing education programs, guaranteed. For more information about this self-study activity, go to www.cmeinfo.com slash 767V or call us at 1-800-284-8433.